I like Batman. Here's some bat burgers I had for my birthday. I think a lot about Batman. I think particularly about why I'm dissatisfied with any representation of the character outside of toys, Adam West and old comic books. It feels like the more grown up they try and make him, the more juvenile and insubstantial he looks. The masked hero has been an attractive character since antiquity. There's lots of reasons for that, but it might have something to do with the idea of taking no credit for marvellous deeds, the moral ideal of ego sacrifice, and perhaps to be closer to God in that the hero is invisible, intangible, even as they are the physical fists of cosmic good. But unlike a modern Bruce Wayne, the mask hero was always essentially one person. There was a, there was a dual identity, but no pretense at, at duality. When they weren't fighting evil, they, they were figuring out how next to fight evil. This made them easy figures on which to hang our moral aspirations and control fantasies, traits that the vast majority of people share. This allowed them to dissolve into and permeate whole cultures. This is the thing that made them universal. And the, the potency of this archetype is, is compromised when we try to do the modern thing of attempting to colour in and add detail to the distinction between Bruce Wayne and Batman. Now this is done presumably in the interests of psychological verisimilitude, but it has the opposite and undesired effect because if Bruce Wayne, as he's represented in the movies, was a real person, then that person would have real clinical problems, juggling persona as he does, seemingly without consequences to his mental health outside of the occasional bout of generic introspection. He would indicate at best a form of dissociative disorder, and at worst, psychopathy, which makes it hard for us to accept him as an archetype, because what he actually represents is a, is a fringe condition, rather than a universal one, like heroes are supposed to. So Batman is now living in a purgatory between his archetypal and postmodern form, a victim of our inability to change archetypes by decree. Archetypes do change, however. It's just that in the social ecosystem, they're one of the slowest things to change. Like animals, they speciate very slowly over centuries, and in partial and minute measure as they adapt or fail to adapt to the changing environment. What, what usually happens, long before myths get altered fundamentally, is that they undergo a temporary change of outfit, get a makeover. They are repainted in order to fit the needs of the extant culture. After many different small revisions, there comes a point at which culture begins to reevaluate the usefulness of a thing in its essential form. Now the square myth has to start shaving off its edges if it wants to fit into a round society. Again, this doesn't happen by decree. It happens as a consequence of a whole society acting unconsciously, which moves and, and should be allowed to move, for want of a better word, organically. If you force changes in the landscape, people will feel tremors. They sense that someone's conscious agenda is involved and then you have unrest. Sometimes, inevitably, changes have to be forced, like with the COVID situation, and there has been unrest. I'm still trying to work out why so many Americans are not just mildly exasperated, but on fire with indignation at the idea of having to wear safety masks, the, the protective masks. I mean, you'd think they'd be into it, but that's, that's a subject for a whole video in itself. It's really encouraging, though, that we've managed to adapt as well as we have. And this has made me think about the nature of good foundations, the need for a society that bends with change and yet keeps integrity. The need for that rather than edifices that are so rigid that they can only break. We need to be organic, adaptable, imaginative. It's our ability to navigate uncertainty, the willingness to admit that uncertainty exists that will, in my opinion, give us the improvements we're looking for. That and a resistance to the idea that we can somehow expel difficulty by changing the nature of nature. 
you know, political insistence is like framing yourself as the sun versus the moon. But in reality, we all, all of us, all the time, exist on the border between the one thing dimming and the other one coming into light. I like this quote from uh, Tovi Janssen, who also loved borders. Twilight is the border between day and night, and the shore is the border between sea and land. The border is longing, when both have fallen in love but still haven't said anything. The border is to be on the way. It is the way that is the most important thing. And that's, that's really where you want to be. Not being stretched like Batman towards some ill-gotten idea of maturity, authored by people that are trying to alter a cultural expression before they've even understood what is being expressed. You can't somehow know a thing before you know it, or, or do a thing before you can actually do it. We defer to things that can weather change. 